He went to his hotel room. He said, I finally opened my Bible and knelt down beside the bed just to have some private devotional time, something he said I just don't feel like I'd had in a long time. Kneeling beside the bed, he said he fell asleep in that position. And he woke up in the middle of the night and he heard the Lord say to him, I've seen your ministry. Now let me show you mine. How many of you would like to see God's ministry? Woo! Well, he said he quit his job right then as a church growth consultant with Fuller. He went back to California. Long story short, he started pastoring that little church of about 50 people, that little house church. And there he began his journey with God. God was going to teach him things that would literally shift his paradigm and launch him into a signs and wonders ministry that would ultimately start the third wave of renewal and spark revival around the world. Two ways that God taught him. Through the mind, you do have to have the mind of Christ. You do have to begin to understand this book, Revelation Knowledge. But it also, you have to have that experience in your heart there has to be experiential knowledge. And that's exactly the, the, the two-lane road that God is taking Wimber down now for the next few years of his life that will come out in that funnel on the other side that will give us some information that we can apply to our own life, okay? This reminds me of Robert Clinton's book, The Making of a Leader. Clinton says that God, at some, God takes... Everything that we have learned, everything that we have experienced in our Christian life, whether it's good, whether it's bad, whether it's our failures, things that we're ashamed of, things that we're really proud of, whatever it is, he takes those experiences. And if we will stay submitted to him, and if we will allow him, he will take these and bring us to the place of convergence. A place where it all comes together, it all fits. Now, at any point along the way, and when the pain gets too great, we can say, I want to stop. I'm not going on any farther. And God will allow us to do that and let us park right where we are. And a lot of people wonder, why don't I ever come into the fullness of my destiny? We just have to keep saying yes. Just keep saying yes, because he's able to cir circuitously bring us back on path if we will just keep saying yes in the face of pain. And there will be pain in the offering. So, convergence. That's what God wants to bring. And that's exactly what's happening now in Wimber's life. His music career, his pastoring, his consulting, it's all good Stuff that he's learned and God is bringing him to this place where he can mold him into that more vessel and show him God's ministry. So the first thing that God did was to show him his ministry was take him back and show him the ministry of Jesus. That's exactly right. Now this is significant. Taking Wimber back to the Gospels and showing him the ministry of Jesus. It's really important, okay? I'm going to get a little bit technical, but it's going to be worth it, okay? Just a little tiny, just a little tiny technical paragraph here, okay? Evangelicals look to Paul, the apostle, in the epistles to formulate doctrine. The epistles are didactic. In other words, they, that you would say they are prescriptive. They, they teach. They are teaching. And therefore, you can take the epistles and use them to formulate doctrine. On the other hand, evangelicals say that the gospels are descriptive. They are simply describing history and what's taking place. And they say that historical books cannot be used to formulate doctrine. So what does that do? It strips the guts right out of the gospel and the ministry of Jesus. Right? And so we end up with
with a hermeneutic that puts the lens of Apostle Paul on and reads and dissects the works of Jesus. We read Jesus through the eyes of Paul. That's a good place to pause. I'll do that Bill Johnson thing. (laughs) Pentecostals believe that we can use historical genre like the Gospels and Acts. But they primarily look at the book of Luke and Acts to substantiate or support their understanding of the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Wimber was about to discover that God has a different perspective. Now, that was a good wow. (laughs) Wimber was about to discover that God has a different perspective than the evangelicals and the Pentecostals. So the Lord took Wimber back to Matthew 9, 1 through 8. <clears throat> Remember the story of the paralytic <clears throat> where they tore off the roof, which the board members probably in this church would be really upset about. <laughs> they let the man down, right, in front of Jesus. And Jesus said to the paralytic, your sins are forgiven. Rise, take your mat and walk. Well, the people were excited, the man was excited, but the Pharisees were not very excited, right? So Jesus said to them, which is easier, to forgive sins or to, say, be healed? There's not an evangelical church probably around that wouldn't say, if you have an altar call, people come down, they cry and they repent, and you would say, oh, your sins are forgiven, go home. Right? But if any one of those people came down and said, I have terminal cancer, will you pray for me? They would say, well, if it be God's will. Right? But Jesus is saying here, he's kind of tying it together, right? So God asked John at that point, how can you be assured the forgiveness of sin that you cannot measure when you cannot believe for healing that you can measure? And Wimber, you know, scratching his head and thinking about it, and he goes, Well, what about the people that don't get healed? And Jesus or the Father said to him, what about people that don't get saved? So he realized at that moment that God had tied healing and salvation together. Right then, he said, I realize that. Remember the evangelist. Just as I was responsible for preaching the gospel, God was holding me accountable for praying for the sick in equal measure. He said, I understood that God wanted people healed, spirit, soul, and body. Needless to say, this is a major paradigm shift for Wimber. Then God, taking him another step, said... Let me show you the ministry. Took him to John 14, 12. If you have faith in me, you will, be, you will do what I've been doing, Jesus said. If you have faith in me, you'll do what I've been doing. So what's, what's Jesus been doing? Well, it says Jesus went throughout Galilee, teaching in synagogues, proclaiming the good news of the kingdom and healing every disease and sickness among the people. And people brought to him all who were ill with various diseases, those suffering severe pain, the demon possessed, having seizures, those paralyzed, and he healed them. That's what Jesus did. He proclaimed the good news of the kingdom. He healed every disease and sickness. And Wimber said, when I saw that, it hit me really 
hard. And he thought, I've only been doing half the job. He says, I preach the gospel, but I've never done the works that Jesus did. And he loved to hold up a menu and he'd say, it would be like going into a restaurant, studying the menu, memorizing the menu, but never ordering a meal and eating. Or it would be like taking a scuba diving class and reading all the books and studying all the equipment, but never getting in the water. He said, that is really the sum total of my ministry. And he said, at that moment, the Gospels ceased being history books and became my job description. They stopped being history books and became my job description. So the model... God's ministry is Jesus. You see, he realized that Jesus is the leader. Therefore, we need to follow the leader. So not only do we get to do the stuff that Jesus did, we're actually called and commissioned to do the stuff that Jesus did. It's not enough to take this book and highlight it and underline it and memorize it. We're supposed to, this is our training manual. This is our training manual. We're supposed to take this book, see what Jesus did, and go out and do the stuff that Jesus did.